Greetings viewers, it's been a while since my last video. Today I will show off a modem demo using some of the new communications blocks and techniques available in Pothos. But first, a quick status update for major milestones since the last video and what's going on right now. So it's now September 2015. Release 0.21 has just been tagged and there's now a main branch tracking changes on top of that. And the master branch is now tracking changes for a 0.3 release, which includes some new features, some reorganization, and some new toolkits. In an effort to stabilize certain toolkits, and because not everyone uses Pothos for communications, all DSP and communications blocks have been moved to the new comms toolkit. And all of the signal analysis plotters have been moved to the new plotters toolkit. So the SDR toolkit and its underlying support library Soapy SDR will continue to grow together. Just recently, hooks have been added for GPIO control, readback, and also additional readback sensors. And also for version 03, there will be improvements to the JSON Describe Topology feature as well as the remote topology support, in particular, SSL. Users deploying topologies in an untrusted network environment, such as a cloud, may need secure sockets. And for those who don't already know, we have Windows and Linux binaries, including an ARM PPA for Ubuntu, and those are all in the 0.2 series. And I recently uploaded a tutorial for the SDR blocks that goes into detail about parameters, advanced streaming, and helpful paradigms, all with uh, nice screenshots. So now I would like to talk about the hardware that I will be using for the modem demo. I recently got my hands on some Blade RFs. Now Blade RF is a USB super speed device. It's relatively small, bus powered, and at a good price point. But what I really like about the device is that its driver is very complete and well documented, and that it has the timestamp burst feature, which I think is critical to have for any good SDR hardware platform. Blade RF was previously supported in SOAPI SDR through the SOAPI Osmo plugin, but I wanted to be able to use the timestamp and burst features. So I went ahead and created a new plugin called Soapy Blade RF, specifically for this device. Soapy Blade RF is available under the same licensing terms as the Blade RF driver itself, and can be found by following the link at the bottom of this slide. Now the slideshow ends, and the screencast can begin. This video will demonstrate a simple QPSK modem using some of the new communications blocks and the Blade RF hardware to loop back over the air. Welcome to the QPSK modem demo. What we have here are three basic tabs. A display tab with widgets and plotters that allow us to interact with the design, a transmit tab with the modulation chain, and a receive tab with the demodulation chain. Now let's go ahead and run this. Now any message I type into this box will be encoded and transmitted as QPSK. And we can see what happened here. My message was encoded into two-bit symbols for QPSK, it was framed and modulated, as we can see in the transmit data. The wave monitor on the receive chain was able to trigger on this burst, and we can see basically the same structure here with a phase shift. And we can also see that our frame synchronizer was properly able to lock onto our frame, and here we have all of our uh, constellations points located in the correct quadrants. And here it is. Here's our message sent all the way over the air, showing up in this chat box. So now let's go check out the transmit chain in more detail. Let's go over the transmit chain from left to right in the order of data flow. First we have the chat box. Whenever a user enters a message into this box, it will be output as a binary payload containing that message. Each byte in that payload or packet will be encoded into multiple 2-bit symbols. 2 bits because we have four constellation points for QPSK. Next we have the packet to stream block. This block will take us from the packet domain into a streaming sample domain. Notice that the start and end labels are specified for this block. The packet to stream block will decorate the bounds of our packet with start and end labels so that downstream blocks will also know the bounds of this packet. Next we have the symbol mapper. This takes each 2-bit symbol and maps it into a complex QPSK constellation point. After that we have the frame insertion block. This block's responsible for inserting a frame header that encodes the length, as well as training information, so on the receiver end we can recover time, phase, and frequency error. Next we have the match filter, which is programmed with root raise cosine taps. 
It also has an interpolation of four set because we'll be transmitting four samples per symbol. Also notice that the TX end label ID is set. Whenever the fur filter encounters the TX end label, it'll flush out all of its history. This allows us to send an, an entire burst thoroughly and completely through the filter without interfering with subsequent bursts. And finally, we have this structure, which is responsible for scheduling transmit bursts. The reason we schedule transmit bursts is because typically a single burst will be composed of multiple transfers into the hardware. Now, if the hardware receives a transfer and there's a large enough gap between that and the second transfer, it will underflow and our burst will be fragmented in time. In order to avoid that, this TX burst timer block, which is provided with the SDR toolkit, will apply a TX time label given a relatively good idea of what the current hardware time is so that the samples can arrive into the device and be queued up properly and completely and transmitted as one continuous piece. So what we've done here is we use the periodic trigger to cause the SDR sync to periodically output its hardware time. Now the TX burst timer just keeps an up-to-date count of what time it thinks is on the hardware and anytime a packet comes in it looks, looks for a start label and creates a TX time label with a timestamp in the near future. And this goes into the SDR sync and is properly sent to the device to be transmitted. Now let's walk through the receiver chain. The SDR source is providing a continuous stream of samples. Next, because we don't have automatic DC removal in the Blade RF, we're using a DC removal block here. The frame sync is sensitive to DC level, so we're going to have to remove it. Now I should note that there's DC removal calibration utilities that come with the Blade RF. I just haven't played with them yet. Next is our match filter. Here we're passing in the same root raise cosine taps from the fur designer in the TX channel using a breaker. Notice that the decimation here is 1 and not 4. We're going to need those extra samples per symbol to perform timing recovery in the frame sync. Next in line is the frame sync. The frame sync locates a frame within a stream and uses the training symbols and frame header fields to recover frequency, phase, and timing offsets as well as packet length. The frame sync then forwards the payload to the output with a stream label, in this case start, to decorate the packet's boundaries. Notice that many of the parameters in the frame sync match up with the frame insertion block. Also notice that we have passed the samples per symbol, four in this case for data width, into the input parameters. Now the frame sync has multiple output modes. Here we use the timing recovery mode, in which the frame sync outputs symbols at the original symbol rate using the initial phase and timing offset measurements as guides. Now this mode is more error prone in high noise environments as it doesn't track phase and sample offsets over time. We will explore phase and timing tracking loops and the other output modes at a later date. The symbol slicer takes the timing recovered samples and remaps them into two bit symbols by figuring out which constellation point each sample is closest to. Then, we finally make it back from the streaming domain into the packet domain using the uh, start label that we applied earlier in the frame sync. Once we're back in the packet domain, the two bit symbols are remapped into bytes. And finally, this byte payload is passed into the chat box and displayed on the screen. So I hope you all enjoyed this demo and found it informative. Moving on, I think I'd like to give the RxDC calibration a go and see if we can get rid of that DC removal block. And in addition to the timing and phase recovery I mentioned, I'd also like to introduce forward error correction so we can code redundancy into the payloads and look at some kind of advanced burst scheduling, uh, maybe implement TDMA or something like that. And expanding on this demo, we have some nice Mac and link layer control blocks that we can build on top of these file layers we've shown today. Check out the following links to get a hold of this demo or to get help or support. Thanks for watching.